please stand. I am the resurrection, the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant Elsie, and grant her an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading from the Revelation to John. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The word of the Lord.
Good morning, everyone. It is a true honor to join you in celebrating the life of Elsie Hillman, whose capacity to do good may never be matched, but that can serve as a source of inspiration for all of us. Let me begin with expressions of sympathy and thanks to you, Henry, and to all of the members of the Hillman family. The community's sense of loss is so great that we do have at least some measure of the depth of the family's grief. And we all always will be grateful to all of you, not only for sharing Elsie so generously, but also for joining her in advancing so many worthy causes. Two books about Elsie were written in the recent past, and I want to tell you a bit about them. Both were the products of a collaboration between Kathy McCauley, who I will loosely describe as Elsie's biographer, and Terry Miller, who is the director of the Institute of Politics at Pitt, and who will lead the Elsie Hillman Civic Forum. The first of these books was written in the style of a fairy tale and targeted to a limited audience, the Hillman family. Its title is Once Upon a Time in Pittsburgh, and it begins this way. Once upon a time, there lived a little girl named Elsie. She was as clever and funny as she was beautiful. One day she made a wish. I'd like to meet a handsome prince and have four wonderful children. Oh, and help cure cancer, she said. <laughs> she set out on an adventure that would take her far beyond her home, where she met Henry, the prince of her dreams. They can tell a grand story about their marriage and their life with their children and grandchildren they love. The book goes on to chronicle in simple text and memorable photographs Elsie's civic and political life before concluding in this way. Elsie's dreams have come true. Her husband is wonderful. Her family is wonderful. And she and Henry even are helping to cure cancer. And that is how Elsie became the queen of Pittsburgh. For me, that's a perfect way to think about Elsie, the Queen of Pittsburgh. Her impact did extend far beyond this region, but Pittsburgh was her home, the place she loved, the place she served, and the place that she enhanced so dramatically. And she did so many great things here that she triggered unique feelings of respect and affection throughout the community. In portraying Elsie as royalty, though, it is important to underscore that she was not a fan of ceremonial trappings, uh, and she did not ascend to her throne as a matter of birthright. Uh, instead, she was a queen with a common touch and a monarch by merit. She led a life characterized by a warm heart, a caring touch, boundless energy, determination worthy of the Steel City, and an unmatched record of hard work in her never-ending quest to help others. Among the causes she championed were women's rights, civil rights, and health education, and welfare for those in need. When the city and its public schools faced challenges, Elsie was there to lead uh, assessment, enhancement, or reform efforts falling under what some might say was the misguided influence of others. She regularly appeared in attire more fitting for a jester than a queen in order to advance the cause of public television. When our social services safety net frayed in the aftermath of the Great Depression recession, she was there to help stitch it back together. She also was a woman for all seasons, helping to bring ice skating to PPG Place and leading the efforts to keep the city's pools open when they were threatened by the budget acts. 
When the AIDS epidemic struck, she and Henry not only provided financial support, but delivered meals and took flowers to those who were ill. And of course, they have paid, played a major role in making Pittsburgh one of the world centers of cancer care and cancer research. It has been said that the cemeteries of the world are filled with indispensable people, suggesting that none of us are, in the end, irreplaceable. Uh, whoever uttered that thought obviously never met Elsie Hillman. I doubt that any of us has ever seen more good packed into a single package than we found in Elsie. She was as close to perfection as we ever are likely to see walking the face of this earth. And to our good fortune, she did most of her walking here in Pittsburgh and in the company of a husband who shared both her remarkable human qualities and her heartfelt commitment to advancing the greater good. The second book written about Elsie examined her political life. She resisted its publication for years until she finally understood that her story could serve as an inspiring model for generations to come. I need not tell you much about this book because copies of it will be distributed at the reception following the service so you can read it for yourselves. However, I do want to share its opening Elsie quote, which might be uh, called her civic creed. It is possible, she said, to see something good and to work for it and even dare to achieve it. Don't be a spectator. You are needed in every corner of the community. None of us could hope individually to pick up the entire load that was carried such a distance and for so many years by Elsie. But collectively, we can pursue the goals that she held so dear and advanced so effectively. Please do note that the quote I read was built around an admonition, not a request. Don't be a spectator, Elsie said. And her directive was accompanied by an observation that help is needed in every corner of the community. Our most meaningful expressions of love and respect will come then when we take on some worthy task with Elsie's words and deeds in our minds and in our hearts. In that way, we will become a living extension of her amazing and still growing legacy. I feel comfortable in extending thanks in advance from Elsie to each of you for doing If Frank Capra wrote a contemporary script for It's a Wonderful Life, the fictional community would be replaced by Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the leading role would go from one Pennsylvanian, Jimmy Stewart, to another, Elsie Helm. So today in this setting, as we celebrate and I would say Elsie would want you to celebrate a life well lived. We should ask ourselves, what would Pittsburgh look like without Elsie and her beloved Henry? Actually, two of the oldest teenagers I've ever known. <laughs> what would the state look like? What would our country look like? 
And I ask you personally, and I would ask many throughout this community, what would be different in your life if you had not been blessed by the grace of Elsie's presence? The strength of her character, her welcoming nature, and the compassion within her heart affected all of us in a very personal way, as well as this entire community. Now, it is impossible to celebrate a life well-lived in a country well-served without noting Elsie's passion for politics and government. She believed under the right circumstances, government should play a meaningful role and be a positive force in people's lives. For generations, Elsie was the dominant and benevolent leader in our state, by the way, with friends on both sides of the aisle. She was always about inclusion. She reflected and was the party of Lincoln, and forgive me, Elsie, probably the party of Papa Bush as well. I know George Herbert Walker Bush was your buddy. She was all in for all of us. Trust me on this, I speak from experience. If you were a candidate in this region, or for that matter, statewide office, and you sought as much broad-based political support you could as you went from one county to another, 67 counties, inevitably, predictably, one of the most important questions you better be prepared to answer is, to the question was, where's Elsie on this? Who's Elsie supporting? Elsie's embrace was the equivalent of the political good housekeeping seal of approval. And those of us who have been privileged to serve in government understand and appreciate that every candidate, regardless of the side of the aisle, initially relies heavily on the credibility and the coattails of others until they can establish their own credibility. Well, let me tell you, Elsie Hillman had really, really long coattails. Who did Elsie support? Well, let's talk President Eisenhower and President Bush, father and son, Senators Hughes, Scott, John Hines, Arlen Specter, Governor Scranton and Scranton, Thornburg, Ridge, Schweiker, Corbett, and that's just part of the list. And Elsie would want me to mention her loyal and trusted friend, John Denny, who was by her side every political step along the way. I think John could give personal testimony on many occasions that Elsie, regardless of whether it was a civic cause or a political cause, could turn mission impossible into mission, let's just get it done. How many of my political friends would be missing one or two or three titles from their political resume without Elsie? I'm one of them. And when Elsie could, she would use her political network to help others. I've often wondered how many young men and women got their first job after Elsie made a phone call. She was a relentless advocate and a crusader for Republican women in our state and throughout the country. Her friend Ann Anstein and she were the twin pillars around which my friend Mark Schweiker and I sought our party's, no party's nomination for governor and lieutenant governor. History records they did a pretty good job. Can you imagine, can you imagine what the Republican or Democrat parties would look like today if they conducted themselves with civility and purpose? Elsie's way. Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> now, Elsie always recognized the goodness in people. She had a grace about her, an ease, a great sense of emo emotional hospitality when you were in her orbit. Whether you were head of state, a CEO, or you're the parking lot attendant, Elsie was Elsie. A friend of mine attending the ceremony tonight came in from the airport last night and 
just mentioned to the cab driver that he was going to attend a, a funeral today. Actually, he said a party, a celebration of a wonderful person's life. And the cab driver said, oh, Elsie, <laughs> loved and beloved. And perhaps most importantly, she was our strong, loyal, and loving friend. There was a spirit, a joyfulness in her life that is difficult to describe, but ever present for all to see. A sense of humor in that marvelous laugh to light up the room. And importantly, and I think in this day and age, it's more important than ever, her humor was never at anyone else's expense. The Elsie way was supportive and empathetic and humble. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many people here ever asked Elsie to get them out of a jam? And the next one, I certainly don't want to ask you to raise your hand, or even out of jail. <laughs> Elsie and Henry were in so many ways bigger than life. She and Henry were always thinking of others. Elsie called her dear friend Nancy Holman a few hours before her death. And Elsie told Nancy, thank you for all you taught me. You should know that Mr. Hellman, I know, call me Henry, called me, called me to thank me for participating in this service and the celebration of Elsie's life. That is the Hillman way. That was Elsie's way. How many of you received handwritten notes of thanks from Elsie? And how many received a thank you note for your thank you note? <laughs> that was Elsie. Maybe, forgive me, Henry, she figured she should always have the last word with us because you always had the last word with you. <laughs> when Elsie referred to you as dearie, what a badge of honor. That was very, very special. And with Elsie, her friendship and her notes started with love, and they ended with love. She laughed with us, she cried with us, and her door was always open to us. Elsie had a sense of freedom about her. I have always believed that that joyful, spirited, exciting, and wonderfully productive life she lived was based on her adoration and love for Henry and the faith they had in one another. And Henry's faith and our faith in Elsie was very well placed. Elsie was a woman for the ages who will never be forgotten. She was a modern prophet in her own hometown. Elsie was a gift from a loving God. And so to Henry and to Elsie's family, we thank you for sharing her with us. And if you'll close your eyes for a moment and picture this vivacious, loving, and loved, energetic, and sweetened countenance of Elsie Hillman, and recognize with me her special place in our lives and say, may Pennsylvania's brooks and streams and singing hills join our chorus too. And every Pennsylvania wind that blows sends our love to you. Elsie, we miss you dearly. And we all look forward to seeing you in God's time.
Good morning, the clergy, Henry and the Hillman family, friends. Uh, it's a remarkable morning, Elsie. When you asked Elsie what or who she was, the first thing she said was wife. Secondly, mother. Very proud of those issues. But for us, she was our friend. She was everyone's friend. She was a remarkable friend. She was a friend not only to us, but she was a friend to everyone. Everyone. And when you stop and think about the things that she did in her life, she befriended everyone and did things for everyone. But she did it differently. She did it in a very personal way. How many of us were personal friends of Henry, or of Elsie? How many? All personal friends. And why? Because when Elsie greeted you, she met you, she shook your hand, she looked you in the face, she had that wonderful smile, and she said, how are you, who are you, where are you from, how's your family? And she did it in a very sincere way. And how do you know? Because the next time you saw her, she walked up to you with a smile, shook your hand, and remembered who you were, and asked you about the last time you were together. Unbelievable, with that same smile. The governor mentioned the notes. How about the notes? All the notes, well written, remarkably well detailed in her handwriting, obviously well thought out, and also ended, love Elsie. Who does that? Who does that? And then there are the phone calls. There are the phone calls, the wonderful phone calls. Hello, dearie. Now, you know, you know something's coming. But when you heard it, you smiled. You smiled. And, and there was always something that was going to happen that you wanted to be part of. And when you think of how personal Elsie was, and, and she was personal to each and every one of us, and you stop and think about all the things that she did with us, for us, the funds we had, the, the th causes that she supported, each and every one of you could be standing here right now. Each and every one of you could be giving your story, talking about the issues that you worked with that, with Elsie. And so if we take a moment from her, or a page out of a book uh, written by her good friend Fred Rogers, The Neighborhood of Make Believe, why don't we just stop for a second and each of us imagine that we were standing here. What story would we tell? What subject would we cover? Because each of you could. Let's think about <clears throat> those subjects. Women, women's rights, women in politics, women on boards, women in education. Did you, were you involved with her there? Pen the Pennsylvania Center for Women in Politics, women candidates, all public issues that we, she supported. Or was it something as private as a woman in Texas who was suffering under an abused husband who wrote to Elsie and contacted her through the Hillman Company? She sent legal counsel to relieve her from that issue. The woman later moved to Pittsburgh, remarried. Elsie never met her. It wasn't a friend of Elsie's. It was just the right thing to do, which was what Elsie did. Diversity and inclusion. Who goes to the Hill District the day Martin Luther King died? To share the suffering. That's real inclusion. Obviously, the Hill House that she supported for decades and decades. She chaired the Art for AIDS, the African American Chamber of Commerce. But then also, she bought a home for a friend of hers in the early 80s on Negley Avenue who had AIDS because they were going to move him out of the house. She supported him quietly. There are other things you could talk about, I'm sure. Education, the Hill House, of course. But WQED, how committed she was to public broadcasting and public education, amazing commitment, the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, early child education, extra mile, Pittsburgh City Schools, and so many others. But each of you were touched with her. How about kids? How many things can we talk about kids? That could go on forever. But remember in the spring of 04 when the city was having problems and it wasn't going to open the pools, I mean, I saw Elsie occasionally get excited, but over that one, it was a big deal. And those pools were open. Save our summer. Save our summer. Economic development that goes on and on. 
Elsie's co-chairing the Regional Renaissance Initiative. She was a key person in the Regional Asset District. The Hillman Roderick Committee when the city had problems. The RAND studies when she supported RAND to make sure that things were right. And in the arts, I mean, you go on and on. Whether it's the Elsie Award, she was on the board of the symphony, on and on. How many people did she touch with those commitments? And then there was the use of Henry. Now, Henry was on the PNC board many years ago. I didn't really know him. I was in awe of Henry, still am. And I, I understood him to be a mild-mannered gentleman. But when we were raising money for the Hill House, we had come up with a plan. And we thought we had the answer. And Elsie said, you know, I don't think this is enough. He said, I can't take this home to Henry. I mean, this just won't fly with Henry. So we said, oh, okay, well, whatever that is, we get the pencils back, start all over again. The Hillman Roderick Committee, we met on and on, had a number of initiatives that we were going to do to help the city. We thought we had it finished. The Mayor Murphy's here. Remember when she said, you know, I don't think we've done enough. I can't bring this home to Henry. This won't pass his muster. I thought, what is this Henry? This must be some kind of an ogre she keeps in the closet. Well, she brings him out, you know. And later I called her on it as I got to know Henry much better. I said, this, we can't take this home to Henry thing. I said, this is a hoax. She smiled. She said, smile. She smiled. She said, yeah, yes, it is. Uh, but isn't it great how it works? And my, my last one, uh, my last one was at the, uh, at the hat luncheon just a couple of years ago, uh, raising money for the Parks Conservancy, and, uh, and, and so we had the lunch, and the luncheon was just ending. I was fortunate to be seated next to Elsie, and Elsie turned to me and she said, I'm going to leave early. I want to leave before, uh, before the crowd does. And I said, uh, well, I'll, I'll walk you out. Uh, and so I'm walking Elsie out, and I, I turned to her and I said, uh, do, you, do you need a ride or anything anywhere? She said, well, no, no. I said, I, she said, I, I have my car picking me up. I said, what to myself, what a fool. Of course, this is Mrs. Hillman. Of course she has her car picking her up. We got to the curb. Her car pulled up, of course. And her driver was Elsie, was Henry, of course. <laughs> That's the way it was. That's the way it was. When you think of all of these things, all of these stories that you might tell that touch all of these different subjects, the one thing that it had in common was that every single one of those initiatives were successful. She brought people together, she created success, and she created wonderful things and improvement for the lives of others. So each of you could tell those stories here this morning, but they would all have one thing. They would have a theme about a tireless woman who gave of herself for the betterment of others. She was a great leader, a remarkable example, and a wonderful convener. When you got the call, Deary, you knew it was for a worthwhile initiative to benefit others. She would bring a solid group together. She would bring her spirit and smile and sense of humor. And we would do the right thing for other people. And it was never, ever about Elsie. Thank you, Elsie, for your passion for people and for Pittsburgh. Thank you, Henry and the Hillman families for sharing her with us. We know you miss her, and so do we. We miss her spirit, we miss her smile, we miss her laugh, but most of all, we miss her friendship. We and many others are much better off because of the magnificent friend that we each called Elsie.
more than 40 years ago as I was completing my seminary education, the final examination in Holy Scripture was an oral one, and there was only one question. Mr. Lewis announced the examining chaplain, it is said that the Bible begins in a garden and ends in a city. Comment on the role of a city in Holy Scripture. It was, at one level, a trick question. For the holy city seen by John in the book of Revelation was, in the mind of its author, a replica of the Garden of Eden before the fall. And nor was that holy city merely a vision of heaven, but a vision of heaven here on earth. For we read, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it is in this context that Jesus pronounces, Behold, I am making all things new. My friends, as we gather this morning to give thanks for the life and witness of Elsie Hilliard Hillman and to commit her to the never failing care of her Creator and Redeemer, I put to you that Elsie was committed throughout her life to assisting her Lord in making all things new by making it possible for all of God's people on this fragile earth, our island home, to catch a glimpse of that holy Jerusalem. And I needn't remind you that the New Testament word translated as city is polis, which, as my Greek professor would say, comes from our word politics. It is in this sense, therefore, that Elsie was an exemplary political organizer, a consummate political activist, indeed, and she wouldn't mind my saying so, the quintessential political animal. It was her passion, her ministry, her life's work. Elsie took Jesus at his word when he said, if you have done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me. This is why, when AIDS was considered a scourge and a punishment against the gay community, Elsie not only delivered baskets of food to people dying from the disease, but remained to eat with them. Elsie believed, that, believed Jesus when he promised that everybody had a birthright to have life and to have it abundantly. This is why she was unstinting in her labors to empower those who are too often at the margins of society, especially women and racial minorities, not with handouts, but with introductions and endorsements to those in positions of power. Elsie trusted Jesus when he said, to those to whom much is given, much will be required. This is why she and Henry have been paragons of philanthropy in this community and have set an example to follow for three more generations in their family. Elsie learned these lessons in this very church where she was baptized nearly nine decades ago and where she continued to be nurtured in the faith, driving herself to the eight o'clock Eucharist every Sunday in a little car with an elephant on the hood. <laughs> Although some people insist that it was a donkey. I believe that Elsie Hilliard Hillman, in her ardent hope to fashion anew the holy city, God's polis here on earth, might well have been inspired by the words of the great hymn writer, James Russell Bowie. Give us, O God, the strength to build the city that hath stood, too long a dream whose laws are love, whose ways are brotherhood, and where the sun that shineth is God's grace for human good. Already in the mind of God, that city riseth fair. Lo, now its splendid challenges the souls that greatly dare. Yes, bids us seize the whole of life and build its glory there. Rest eternal grant unto Elsie, O Lord, 
and may light perpetual shine upon her. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The day before Elsie died, I had the privilege of spending some time with her prayer and just talking. As you might guess, I did most of the listening. She was strong, but struggling. She kept trying to remove her oxygen mask to say one more thing, as her husband of 70 years never left her side. Her last words to me were a type of unforgettable final blessing. I'm ready to go home now. I'm ready to go home. What or with whom is Elsie's new home. In popular culture, heaven is filled with puffy clouds, bad music, and boring people. <laughs> that is not any type of place deserving of her and has nothing to do with the Christian faith and hope. We don't really know. But we can imagine from our own experience what our heavenly home, what hers, might be like. The people in biblical times used the best of their imagination to convey a life fully connected to God and to one another. In their context, what they knew was a dry and dusty desert culture, scarcity of fresh water and food and arable land, and one that was always under threat. That's what they were reacting to, what they knew. From that, what they experienced, what they imagined, they developed two prominent images of paradise. One was a lush and peaceful walled garden, free from suffering, separation, and even death. It was a type of restored Garden of Eden. The second image was of a vibrant city, a new Jerusalem, as the reading calls it. It was that holy city representing heaven come to earth. For God to dwell in the midst of mortals in justice, peace, and love. That was a vision 
of heaven for them. More than a hundred years ago, a priest of this very Calvary Church wrote that our Jerusalem is the city in which we live. It's Pittsburgh. This great city, this great people, is where we will know God and experience a glimpse of heaven come to earth. If we cannot experience it here, we will never find it. But it will take hope and faith and hard work and most of all, imagination. Qualities that Elsie shared and offered in abundance. A great city like this one is far more than buildings made of steel and stone, more than museums and monuments, universities and hospitals, factories and rivers and parks, and even more than its people. A city is a community of imagination, a whole society created and bound together in love for one another. A city, our city, is our home away from our eternal home. Elsie Hillman, I submit to you, worked to bring part of that new Jerusalem into our Jerusalem. She helped bring, in a myriad of large and small ways, a little bit of heaven into our city. She could have lived anywhere, but chose to make this her home. For now, for most of us, it can seem like a great light has gone out, and it can be difficult in times of loss and death to retain hope, to retain perspective, to know that there is more to the future than what we can see, the best we can imagine about heaven, that next world, the next life where she lives is but the faintest shadow of the real thing. Part of our responsibility is to make our city, our home, more like the heavenly one, as she did in her own way, never perfected but always striving towards it. A city that is more just, a city that is more kind, more open, a city more representative of all of God's people, one with more opportunity, one with more beauty, more like the people that we can be together. But to do so will take hard work and hope and imagination. What might this heavenly vision look like for our home and for our own lives? A glimpse of heaven is our city made right for all. Heaven is witnessing the birth of your child. Heaven is being forgiven when you know you don't deserve it. Heaven is being with God and those we love forever without separation or pain. Heaven is seeing your betrothed walk down that aisle for the first time. Heaven is 70 times seven years of marriage with the one who gets you and still loves you. All are just glimpses of this glory to come. That is the heavenly home to which Elsie already has gone and the home for which she made worked possible to make more room for all people to live and to dream. What is heaven, this next life, to you? The best image for me happened on my very first trip to the city. The experience is a metaphor for emerging from one life to the next for beginning to find home. It was one of those perfect September days when all employers should bring in people for job interviews to Pittsburgh. We entered the Fort Pitt Tunnel. As you know, everything is closed in. You can only see what's right in front of you. There's the rhythmic thumping of the road, the monochrome walls of subway tile, bad lighting, stale air, and a faint light off in the distance that holds a bit of promise. All at once, the whole world opens up. Sky and hills and rivers and towers and bridges and colors and people, energy, life, possibility, every direction that you see. You can almost forget how glorious is the vision of our city. A glimpse of heaven is emerging through the tunnel on a sunny afternoon 
when you've been away from home. And that is but the faintest shadow of the life to come. The real thing is the life that Elsie now enjoys and is our hope in Christ. Imagine heaven. Imagine home. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And as the kingdom, the power, In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant, we beseech thee, to thy whole church in paradise and on earth, thy light and thy peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Amen. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Amen. Grant to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Amen. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in thy fatherly care that casting all their grief on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope, in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Help us, we pray, 
in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Grant us grace to entrust Elsie to thy never-failing love. Receive her into the arms of thy mercy and remember her according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people. Grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee, she may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. Grant us with all who have died in the hope of the resurrection to have our consummation and bliss in thy eternal and everlasting glory, and with all thy saints, to receive the crown of life which thou dost promise to all who share in the victory of thy Son, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints. We're sorry. <clears throat> Thou only art immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and unto earth shall we return. For so thou didst ordain when thou createst me, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. All we go down to the dust, Yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Into thy hands, O merciful Savior, we commend thy servant Elsie. Acknowledge we humbly beseech thee a sheep of thine own fold, a lamb of thine own flock, a sinner, thy own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of thy mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God.